this event falls into our democracy and activism strand, which has kindly been sponsored by Abbeydale Brewery. Um, just before I begin, just a, a very few quick housekeeping uh, issues. Um, if you hadn't noticed, the toilets are uh, just at, as you came into the auditorium, uh, the ladies on the right, uh, the gents on the left. Um, we could ask you to all turn your phones onto silent or turn them off, please. Uh, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, lastly, we're not expecting uh, a fire alarm or a fire drill um, this evening. Um, so if a fire alarm does go off, um, please do uh, evacuate the building. Uh, there's a fire escape um, just on the right um, as you leave uh, the auditorium. And just to remind you, please don't use the lifts um, in the event of a fire. Um, thank you very much for coming tonight. I am very excited about uh, tonight's event. Uh, we have two award-winning um, journalists. Please put your hands together and welcome Polly Toynbee and David Walker. Give it up. We said, uh, <coughs> perhaps over courageously, that we should all willingly pay more. Uh, frankly, the talk went down like a lead balloon. But the tides of politics have since ebbed and flowed. Here, for instance, is the Financial Times, just writing. Martin Wolf, in the Financial Times, its chief economics commentator, said out loud, the best way for the UK to meet the pressure on the NHS is to raise taxes. Most serious analysts come to this obvious conclusion. Politicians should tell the people openly and honestly the system they treasure will get more expensive over time as we age, and so taxes will have to rise. Even the Prime Minister seemed this week to have got the message, if only, about the NHS. Polly was sitting uh, on Andrew Marr's sofa last Sunday when uh, Marr's interview with Theresa May ran. And despite all the guff about a dividend, Prime Minister admitted tax increases would be necessary to save the NHS, or at least save in the sense of keeping the show on the road for a few years more. She, Theresa May, is in a hole we recognise digging fast, but it was a spectacular admission for a Conservative Prime Minister to make after all these years of austerity, all those manifesto pledges to reduce the tax burden. She's saying, albeit through gritted teeth, that decent public services depend upon paying more for sustaining in taxes. But we mustn't get carried away. Uh, she, will she or can she deliver? We don't know yet. Hammond's hugely restrictive financial plans remain in place. He hasn't rescinded any of them. And there's much more pain to come, especially for local authorities. Any of you are uh, connected with the council uh, will know about that. And Theresa May is surrounded by people who still believe that public spending should be cut, taxes reduced, and the state should be, sh should be shrunk. And she shares many of, uh, of their beliefs, and she is still absolutely at her core a Thatcherite. But it does seem that after eight years of the onslaught uh, on public services, Westminster's great exhibition of dogma and disarray and running, of them, and running them, sheer public alarm is finally forcing the government to at least fiddle with the gear stick. But only after the damage has been done. Uh, we gave our book uh, the subtitle, How the Attack on the State Harms Us All, writing in the belief that the case has again to be made for social democracy, for, for buoyant public revenues paid into sustained public services, and for the vital role of government in planning, providing, and protecting all our common interests. It was austerity and its consequences that prompted us to write this book. Uh, spending cuts on the scale <coughs> enacted by Osborne and Hammond were not necessary. They were not ordained by some iron economic law. Uh, they were not some act of God. They were a choice that was based on political calculation and backed by party ambition. It's worth briefly rehearsing some truisms of the financial crisis that became the pretext for these years of austerity. Public spending didn't crash the UK economy, private banks did. They had to be bailed out by public money to prevent further catastrophe. Public spending didn't spike in 2009 
because hospitals were getting a great influx of new money or because additional public servants were being recruited. Public spending soared because state money was being used to protect people's mortgages and savings to mitigate the effect of bank collapses that would have killed businesses and shed millions of jobs. Fiscal, this is a quote, fiscal consolidation was a cover for their ideologically driven small state agenda. It wasn't a socialist saying that, it was Vince Cable. And of course it was nonsense to say, as Osborne well knew as he said it, that the UK had maxed out its credit card that was very politically effective, to use a, a domestic uh, analogy, though it made no sense at all. In conditions of economic depression, it's vital that governments fuel demand by borrowing. And there is no identifiable upper threshold, either in cash or, in relati or relative to GDP, in a situation where it turned out the Bank of England could create, as if by magic, hundreds of millions of pounds without affecting inflation. For appearance's sake, the bank effectively gave the money to the very financial institutions that had precipitated the crisis in the first place, in the vain hope that they would uh, expand lending, which they mostly didn't. It would have been far better, we can all now see that, to have pumped the money directly into the economy by building houses, transport links, schools and hospitals. But the story of recent years isn't just about money, debt and the cuts. We called our book Dismembered because it's also about an era of intellectual and organisational assault leading to a depressing public loss of confidence in the public. The self-belief of people who work in the public sector, under assault from politicians, from the Daily Mail, from a, an atmosphere, not just financial, which says the work they do is somehow to be disregarded, is not as good as, not as useful as uh, working in businesses. It's been an era of, the very brief details are in our book, fragmentation. Take schools in England, things are different in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. Finding out who actually runs a school shadowy governors, chief executives whose ability to pay themselves large sums of money seems to be uh, limitless. Uh, the 2012 Health and Social Care Act, which split the NHS up into commissioners, uh, often advised by management consultants and providers who are enjoined to compete with one another to secure contracts. Local enterprise partnerships, not at all uh, easy to see who runs them to whom they're accountable. Um, the encroachment of the private on public space, a, a big subject obviously here in a city such as Sheffield where civic buildings have been potentially, I don't know where things have got to, sold off and the public space reduced, town halls, libraries, museums uh, 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 disappeared. Just uh, this week in the Municipal Journal it was reported that more than 4,000 civic buildings and spaces were sold off each year between 2012 and 2016. And with all of that goes a loss of accountability, a kind of obfuscation of who's actually responsible for uh, public uh, functions. Um, I'm afraid a good example of that is Grenfell Tower tragedy uh, almost exactly a year ago. The organization which the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea had created to, ostensibly to run the tower an arm's length so-called tenant management body. Uh, again, it, who, to, to whom it was account, uh, responsible, what degree of private involvement, these became uh, very, very hard uh, to fathom. Um, and that's before we talk about what's happened to public services that have been outsourced or subject to the so-called private finance initiative. Uh, outsourcing now is worth some 100 billion pounds a year uh, a massive encroachment, not, not all of it bad, but a massive encroachment of private interests into the public sector. Well, as we're here in Sheffield, we probably ought to mention that the city presents a quite acute example of how government has been turned inside out in exactly that way. And we won't get into the specifics of tree felling and the Amy contract with the city council, but it's enough to observe that the council had given up control of a vital function and accountability was lost so citizens could no longer require that their elected representatives 
uh, to answer over a controversial policy, do they simply reply, we can't do anything, it's in the contract. Let's give you a flavour of what we think has been lost or is now in grave jeopardy through the withdrawal or termination of public services that underpin our lives. That's to say, the security, solidarity and civility of our lives together. Well, we've travelled around the country looking at the state of public services. So that's some months ago, and quite a lot of the things that we saw then have actually got worse and will get worse again. But we'd like to give you just a taste of some of the things that we found. For instance, we went to look at environmental health officers. We chose Huntingdonshire uh, at random. And this is one of those unseen services that ticks away beneath the service. Nobody thinks about it very much. They just assume that people are out there checking, inspecting, making sure that things are safe. They deal, and we take them very much for granted, they deal not just with food hygiene, but with housing safety, with landfill and waste sites, clean air, now reaching a mortality of 40,000 through lack of clean air. We found that in Huntingshire, they'd lost, like everywhere else just about, they'd lost a third of their staff, and they no longer take any trainees, so they have no idea what the next generation will do and how they'll get trained up because it was too expensive. Uh, just in this one place, they have uh, 1,300 food outlets that need inspecting. The ones that are riskiest, that are judged as riskiest, are called category A, and they have to be inspected very regularly, about every three months. Uh, and then there's category B, category C, and so on. So I said, well, how are you managing this? They said, oh, we know, it's fine. We're still uh, but didn't say it was fine. They said, no, we're still inspecting everything category A every three months. So I said, well, how do you do that with so many fewer staff? And they said, oh, well, that's easy. We just put many fewer into category A. <laughs> and this is the kind of gaming the system, ticking the box that we found going on all the way through. So on paper, things can look all right. But the reality, when you ask the people who are actually obliged to carry out these heavy cuts to their services makes them absolutely desperate. These are incredibly thorough and serious people who take their jobs very seriously, and particularly in, in Huntington, where they've now had to close two-thirds of their air monitoring services, stations, so they no longer know, really, what the quality of their air is. In the rural county of Shropshire, until a few years ago, the county council supported a link bus which trundled from Ludlow to Bridge North Market Towns through a series of pristine English uh, villages, picking up people, not, not just to go into Bridge North for the market or to visit the GP or the Lime Bay, but also take people to work, uh, to, to allow young people to get access to uh, training courses and so on. That link was cut. Now, uh, a bus still runs. You can still get a bus from some of these villages into Bridge North once a week. Uh, if you're at the end of your road at 9.30, the bus will get you to Bridge North by midday, but unless you're there at half past one, in other words, you've got an hour and a half in Bridge North, you won't get that bus back. One bus once a week, and it's run by volunteers. Now, one of the characteristics of public services is the way in which a service transport has effects on others. Social scientists use the phrase social capital to describe the way in which people's sense of well-being, their sense of who they are, is buoyed up by their interaction with other people. Uh, an older person would go into Bridge North and be able to have a cup of coffee with a friend, ha have a chat, and that, that interaction is evidence to, to increase a sense of well-being and perhaps prevent an older person falling into loneliness or uh, even into ill health. So the withdrawal of the bus service has a knock-on consequence, which paradoxically could increase demand for health services, okay, if they existed uh, in future years. And it's not just uh, a rural thing. Again, just the other day, uh, a report said the number of local bus passenger journeys in England fell 1.4% in the year to March, uh, and in previous years there'd been a similar fall, 1.5%, at a time when local bus fares increased by considerably over prevailing rate of inflation. A service which poorer people tend to use, diminishing <coughs> well-being, social capital reduced. We looked at quite a lot of aspects of the NHS, but we didn't want to go for the obvious. A&E, you tend, in the winter crisis, to get on our television screens quite a lot. 
so we looked at something, you know, sort of, again, one of these sort of bog standard services that you just expect to be there. Went to Southampton and looked at their podiatry service for feet. Uh, it's become a very important service indeed because diabetics are very prone to getting ulcers on their feet. Their feet go numb. Uh, and if they're untreated, they get huge ulcers, great holes in their feet. They can lose uh, the, the use of their limbs very quickly. Uh, what we found there was that, again, a third of, of their posts had been lost. Um, and that they, they were now only able to see people already in a very severe condition. Again, this is something we found over and over again. No time for prevention, no time for treating minor problems, only firefighting by the time something has become extremely serious. And I can tell you it's quite hair-raising sitting in their clinic watching bandages being taken off people who had huge holes in their feet, toes missing, chunks of their feet disappeared. Um, there are fewer than 3,000 podiatrists left in the country to treat 3 million diabetics. Um, and the result of this is that amputations are rising very fast, and there are an estimated 135 amputations a week that podiatrists say could have been saved if only they'd managed to get to those patients sooner. But they can only deal with people at the, people at the extreme end. We visited one of the control centers of the Luton and Bedfordshire Constabulary, the area of Milton Keynes, uh, Luton, uh, and uh, the All County uh, of Bedford. A normal uh, weekday evening, uh, we were uh, sort of inducted into what they do by, by Oscar One, which is the call handle of the, the, the control center's uh, police officer manager. He said, um, we tend to get, on an average evening into the night, uh, 18 calls, which I judge on the basis of my 15 years of experience as a police officer, to need uh, a, a response, a vehicle or an officer to go out there. I have 11 officers at my disposal. I am forced into what he called triage. I have to make an instantaneous judgment as to whether this call is more important. And he gave us, we actually, actually heard these uh, examples. Um, parents phone up, um, their child hasn't come back from play, they're worried, they've gone out and looked, they've looked in the local parkland, looked in the local woods, haven't found the child, they're getting anxious. To whom do they turn? They turn to the police. What do the police do? If, as happened, virtually the next minute, a call comes in saying, neighbors have heard noise in an adjoining flat, they've heard a baby crying, they've heard parents shouting in a very, very disturbing way, it sounds like an episode of domestic violence, domestic abuse, and there's a child involved. The police have to grab that, even though clearly uh, the police are not the, the agency you would necessarily turn to to look after a child, but they're the only agency in town, particularly when, and because health social services have uh, recently been. And so th th this, this, this terrible dilemma confronted Oscar one as to which of these pressing cases he had to respond to. And we sometimes see evidence of people being sort of discontent with police response on crime, which has been actually going down. And one of the reasons is the large reduction in the number of police officers available, a reduction which I have to say took place principally when the Prime Minister was Home Secretary. Sure Shark was one of the great things that the Labour government did. 3,500 new Sure Shark centres around the country. Uh, and the most, um, and the best ones were all in the poorest areas. And they had midwives, uh, speech and language therapy. They had, uh, you know, fully functioning, very good nursery schools. They were <clears throat> an absolute model of how to create a hub in a community where parents could come, where there would be a cafe. Um, they were really terrific institutions. Well, a thousand of those have gone, and those that have left have mostly had those professional services stripped out of them that used to be there. We went to visit one that was just closing in Wiley Birch. Wiley Birch is a sort of overspill estate just outside Birmingham, on the edge of Birmingham. It's an hour's plan, uh, it's, sorry, it's a mile pram pushing to the nearest bus stop. There is no uh, police station there, there is no pub, there is no shop, there is no GP surgery, there is just nothing. The one thing there, which was a great relief to them when it was put there, was the Sure Shark which became the real only hub of the community, the place only anybody could turn 
to ask for help, to ask where to get help, to ask for everything that they needed, whether it was about benefits or whatever it was about. And that has now closed, and those, that entire community has been left with really no facilities at all of any kind. And that's been happening all over the country. Now, we're not saying that public services don't need to change, to flex, to adapt. The police role clearly needs to shift in order to catch up with, for example, cybercrime, new offences generated by changing technology. And we're not saying that there's a fixed size for government and what it should spend. Countries vary. There's no one formula. Much depends on a country's history, its political culture, and crucially, on the degree of inequality in that country. But countries are very different. If you look at Japan, their chief executives do not get paid the obscene sums of money that you see in Britain. Uh, but they are, uh, and they are a much more equal country. Um, in, uh, but they have a smaller government, so that there are different ways of reaching the same objective. In France, by contrast, they are uh, much more equal than the UK, and they have a, a much larger government position that provides many more services, as well as, of course, having large stakes, big companies that run rail, <coughs> energy, um, often our own rail and energy too. But if societies are on, as it were, critical paths, determined by their history, Britain seems to have zigzagged, particularly in the last four decades. The, spring, the pendulum swinging abruptly uh, when governments change. During the past 40 years, ideology, it seems, has run rampant in a country which used to pride itself on uh, a much more pragmatic, measured approach to public affairs. And so pragmatic trial and error, which perhaps once was a characteristic, has given way to brash, all or nothing experimentation. Like privatization is an example where, you know, it could have been tested incrementally. You could have, you, you, you could have, um, taken one company at a time and seen how it went. Formats of private water companies uh, could have been compared with state-owned or mutual entities. Instead, of course, the Thatcher government decreed the entire industry would be sold off, and regulation hasn't begun to check the levels of greed of people taking money out of those uh, industries. Private managers have gouged profits and failed to invest. In London, a third of the water supply seeps out of the pipes between the reservoir and household taps. And perhaps when the lights come up, we can ask you uh, whether you know who owns Yorkshire Water, which uh, supplies uh, water and sewage uh, here in Sheffield. Um, it's a difficult question to answer. But it's no exaggeration to say that since the early 1980s, a campaign has been waged against the social state, welfare, public education, the NHS, town and country planning, municipal bus services, and so on. Under David Cameron, uh, a much more ideological figure than his public persona suggested, that state shrinking campaign was extended against the police and the armed services, traditional allies of the Conservative Party. Uh, recently, when we were giving one of these talks, actually it was in Chichester, rather a different place to Sheffield, uh, somebody got up <coughs> and in the audience said, I'm a businessman, I know all about money, I make the country's wealth, and then governments waste it. Uh, that was, has become a sort of common sense uh, of this ideological era, that private is good and public is bad, markets create wealth and the state squanders it. We say, I hope you'll agree, without government, the law and the courts, there can be no contracts. Markets can't function. Without public education, no workforce. Look what happens when training and skills have been left to the market. Firms don't provide for them. The mythology of the market, the demonization of the state persists. Markets only provide, we see, where there's money, profit to be made. Those without means don't get a look in. Left to themselves, markets despoil landscapes and pollute the atmosphere. Without state regulation, competition, there's no level playing field for businesses to compete fairly. Without regulation, trains crash and planes fall from the sky. But it sounds blindingly obvious, and yet there really has been a concerted campaign over recent decades to deny the necessity of state intervention. You've only got to look at the think tanks. The majority of them are firmly on the right of politics, whether it's the Lagarde Institute, the Institute of Economic Affairs, Adam Smith Institute, Social Market Foundation, Policy Exchange, Reform, Centre for Social Justice, founded by Ian Duncan Smith, a particularly oxymoronic outfit, and the tax payers, alliance, and a whole lot more too. Many of them are funded by business interests. Some 
get American corporate money. Their squads of intellectual mercenaries are often in cahoots with journalists on right-wing newspapers, which are, of course, the majority of the printed press, and so their views are echoed in the columns and news reports of titles owned by Rupert Murdoch, Lord Rothermere, the Barclay Brothers, and the rest. And if that sounds like a conspiracy to some extent, I think it really is. It's been a deliberate effort uh, to shift the dial against public spending, against welfare, and government involvement in the economy. I usually remember Oliver Letwin, who was a minister in the Cameron government. He was this sort of ideological minister behind the scenes. His book, Hearts and Minds, describes what he called the root bark. Uh, along the way, he wanted deliberately to create chaos in government as a ploy to persuade people the state doesn't work. We've done rather well at that. As this dire decade nears its end, and if we look ahead, what we see inevitably is a host of problems and opportunities in which government and the state have to be active if we are to have any chance of solving them or exploiting the opportunities. The great experiment of this decade has ended up proving how much we all do need good government, not a vanishing state. For example, uh, we could just list them all. Terror. External threats. China, Russia, Donald Trump, migratory flows. Energy, how to keep the lights on and the energy supply. Artificial intelligence, can you really trust Amazon, Google to sort it out? No, it'll need government. Cybercrime and the threat to our democracy from cyber interference in elections. Obvious, but I'm afraid often neglected, climate change, rising sea levels, rising water tables. Housing and land use, our lack of housing. Uh, the private sector has proved itself absolutely unable and unwilling to provide enough transport. And it's not just a question of who owns Northern Rail or East Midlands trains, it's whether they're integrated into a system of publicly available, publicly useful transport involving buses, other forms of transport as well. Only government can do that. <coughs> who but the state can deal with the risks of antimicrobial resistance, antibiotics becoming uh, useless. It's become a cliche that the UK's productivity performance is markedly less than other European countries. And the reasons are to do complex reasons, but the solution, whatever it is, will have to involve government being involved in some much more direct way, both with individual companies, with industrial sectors, and particularly with vocational training, which, as I said earlier, companies will do. So, just on that, very briefly, since we're in Sheffield, let me give you an example, a positive example, uh, again, of how it's government that underpins, it's not a question of government replacing private enterprise, or government doing what companies can and should do, but government working alongside. Just up the road, we, we, <laughs> we were looking when we came from the station, hoping it was still there. Um, a year and a half ago, we visited a company here in the city called Magnematics, which is involved in trying to develop magnetic gearing, which could be used in hybrid cars and all sorts of applications. But the while the original engineering idea, which was in fact developed at Sheffield University, is a great idea, bringing together a product that is saleable is taking a number of years, during which time venture capitalists get fed up, uh, equity funders say it's taking too long, there's no profit. And it, it's only government that is able to say potentially, as indeed the Japanese government does, as the German government does, say, look, it's, a, it's an interesting, it's a fantastic technology, but it's going to take a long time to bring to market. You, the entrepreneur, are going to need support of various kinds during that transit through what some people call the valley of death between the original uh, research uh, finding and commercial innovation. And we looked at somewhere else where the government seed funding can make the whole difference. Our arts <coughs> uh, industry, in its widest sense, is one of the great thriving things that this country has. And it has relied on government support from the beginning. We looked at uh, the case of the musical Matilda. If anyone's seen it, absolutely brilliant, playing all over the world and bringing in shed loads of money, not just to the Royal Shakespeare Company, but uh, back to the, to the country in all kinds of ways. That could only have happened. It took seven years to develop. The Royal Shakespeare Company says they couldn't possibly have done it without special funding from the Arts Council to help them do that. They said no private uh, producer would have dared to take on such a risk. And um, all the way through the arts, 
funding from the government, which has been severely cut back, is being the essential thing that has helped people to get their careers going, their companies, their businesses going, right across the whole spectrum. And the danger is that there won't be another generation because they won't have had that support that was absolutely essential at the beginning of their careers. There are two pivots uh, on which our argument turns. And very briefly, one of them, I confess, I used to work for an organization called the Audit Commission, whose mission was to look at the spending of councils, to look at the local NHS, uh, to look at the police service, and ask the question, are you providing this service as efficiently, effectively, and economically as you can? And our argument does depend upon there being, within the government, a strong function that secures maximum value for every pound of public money that's raised in taxes and spent. And that pressure should be, must be, constant and applied. And there's no getting away from that. That's uh, a given. The other pivot is tax. Again, just to refer to that briefly. In the United Kingdom, we raise uh, about uh, the tax to the value of some 33% of GDP, compared, say, with 50% in Denmark and 36% in Germany. Again, no fixed sum. Is that such a large portion of our national? Could we not afford one, two, maybe more percent of GDP going in taxes? A big discussion, obviously, to be had about the nature of the tax system. But that, we say, again, repeat, is a precondition of our ability to run decent public services. It's quite clear that the level of taxation we now have is insufficient and would have to grow if we were, again, to have uh, decent public services. Brexit is the news today. Brexit is the news almost every day. It's dominating the airwaves in every kind of way this evening. The failure of the rebellion, uh, it obliterates most other things. We had, a, we had some NHS news this week, but mostly, most of the time, it really has taken over. And that is very much about the nature of the state itself. What kind of state? What should it do? Uh, what does taking back control really mean? Uh, and what kind of uh, regulation are we going to have? What do the Brexiteers mean when they want to get rid of Brexit regulation? Uh, would there really be some great surge of prosperity to compensate all, those, all that we would lose in health and safety at work, protection from unfair dismissal, safe and clean food? I mean, what kind of Britain do we think is going to emerge from this lost decade? We argue it has to be a country where we distinguish what public servants do from the often, and sad to use this phrase, destructive ministers and councillors to whom in a democratic system they answer. It has to be a country where we understand the dependence of markets and profit making utterly respectable on communal infrastructure and services performed by government. It has to be a country where we're prepared, again I repeat, I apologize, to pay the price of decent services which does yes mean additional taxation. Finally, we think people can be persuaded now, now that they've seen so much shrinkage in all the services around them. I think we can say to people, you know, ask yourself, what is it that you really value in life? What is most important to you? And nearly everybody, whenever they're politics, will say, well, it's health, it's <coughs> education, it's safety and security, it's our natural and our historic heritage sites. It's beautiful public buildings, parks, swimming pools, sports centers, theaters, galleries, museums, uh, all of the things that make people of all nations proudest of their country are those things that nations and people have brought together collectively. Mrs. Thatcher used to say, you will always spend a pound in your pocket much better than the state will. And I think when you put that to and you remind them what it is that they really care about, the answer is no, that's not true. You can't buy things in a shop half as valuable as the things that we all buy collectively together. Thank you. Um, and it's your turn to join in.
to add what you, you will to ask us questions, to add your perspective. Disagree. Uh, disagree as much as you like, but it, we'd like to hear from you. We have a microphone and somebody very fleet of foot. <laughs> so uh, who would like to? There's someone down here. We've got two microphones, actually. We'll start with you. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, I recently retired after 40 years in the NHS as a nurse, health visitor, and manager of a child protection service. Um, a few years ago, I actually read the white paper which came out before the Health and Social Care Act that was passed in 2012. And two things in particular really shocked me in the white paper that I think people really aren't particularly aware of. Uh, one, specifically, was that it was categoric that the NHS was not to be an institution, it was going to be a brand. And I think that's a real big serious problem. The other issue, and I think this is what, where you were talking about regulation, was that it was essentially going to become illegal to not uh, accept bids in tenders from private companies. And as you also said, private doesn't believe in regulation. So this is where you're getting, uh, and uh, also recently, the 20 billion pounds, ha ha, that's supposed to be coming in. What I really worry about is it might be going to the NHS, theoretically, but is it going to go to private companies with the NHS logo? And it's not coming into the public sector at all. Um, so, I mean, I could go on. I, have a, I also signed a, a petition about five years ago against a transatlantic trade agreement where America was first in the queue being interested and I'm a bit paranoid and wonder if the 20 billion pounds is a bit of a you know a, a make it look good you know sell it off to America hello Donald it's our NHS well I think what's <laughs> interesting about that I mean you're absolutely right the use of the NHS logo by private companies is an outrage I got something through the door the other day I looked it said NHS NHS partners is what the private bit calls themselves NHS partners that is the private sector and it was something about some kind of private GP thing, and I looked at it. Well, it looked as if it was NHS, and if you didn't know, you would have thought it was. And time and time again, you see that logo on things uh, that are really private. So I think, yes, there has been a dangerous blurring. But I think what's interesting is that the 2012 Act has been such a calamity, such a disaster, that now, finally, the government itself is having to unpick it. And it was actually said this week that they were going to bring in new legislation, which would, in effect, uh, pretty much uh, end or break the cobweb the whole purchase of provider split. And we will go back to, your, I don't know how old you are, but you're probably about my age, maybe a bit younger, to the days when there was a coherence in the NHS. You had regions, you had areas, you, you had the purse held for a whole community in one place, and they decided where that money went. There was no tendering and competing, uh, or a whole competition element that Lansley threw into the system like a hand grenade to blow it into bits. He didn't mind how many bits, how many fragments. Um, it was an absolute disaster, and it's been unmanageable. And Simon Stevens, who's head of the, uh, NA, the bizarrely, NHS England, which is not the same as the department, is trying, I think, to stitch it back together again into coherent units with one financial uh, with one financial center and to try and bring social care into that too. Whether it works or not, I don't know because it has uh, been closed. The, what I was going to just finish off with was my question, but I don't know if I can be perhaps more optimistic from what you've said, I don't know. But my question was, do you think we need to campaign to repeal the Health and Social Care Absolutely. Act? Absolutely. Because it's, it, it, that's what's killing the NHS. I mean, the reason that they're terrified of bringing back the UH NHS Act is, is that, you know, Labour can then amend it and do things to it, whatever it is they bring back. So it may be that they back off because they're just too weak to do that, in which case they're stuck with legally commissioners, the CCCs, uh, in legally in charge of money and legally obliged to tender out. I mean, people, you tend to hear the right wing talking about NHS monstrous bureaucracy very unbureaucratic, but it was. Most of the bureaucracy now is spent on these insane tendering for contracts, which is a waste of everybody's time. Yes. Um, oh, 
Right, we'll take you up there next. Mm, I think what you've just said um, is much too complimentary to Simon Stevens and what you might call disingenuous. I think that's the word they use a lot in the press because the way they're planning to get rid of this purchaser-provider split is through what they call um, accountable care organisations, accountable care I systems. Well, we're facing that in South Yorkshire and Bassett Law, so if you'd done your homework about Sheffield, you would have got beyond the trees and you would have been thinking about the impact of being a vanguard system for um, Jeremy Hunt and Simon Stevens' project. And what they will do is bring together, as you said, the purchaser and provider, bundle it all up, be forced to put it out to tender, and people like Virgin, um, the bearded one, um, are waiting to come in and gobble up these enormous contracts. So what they have done is fragment the NHS. It's different in the four countries. And within England, they created two years ago these 44 footprints. And we're campaigning quite strongly in South Yorkshire and Bassett Law, and we'll be discussing it later next week in the Festival of Debate about what sort of NHS we want, because I don't think we want one that now ticks boxes and models patient throughput and all this kind of marketization way of running the NHS. So I'm not at all optimistic, and um, I hope that you know this is something that you will look into in your Absolutely. journalism. No, I mean, and, I, I write know, about NHS structure a bit and of course I mean I don't I, I actually think accountable care organizations have sort of collapsed as a possibility because it's a legal impossibility the STPs the 44 uh, uh, sustainability uh, STPs I think are going to go ahead but how far I don't know it's very shambolic I mean you're absolutely right that everybody locally should be campaigning should be organizing should be watching and any hint that you know, these things are going to be, these, these organizations are going to be wholesale, let off to the private sector, should become politically impossible. And I actually think, well, I think it will be people like you who make it impossible uh, in each area. And I don't think, actually, it's, go it's going to happen. But you're right, eternal vigilance. And meanwhile, the NHS isn't, as we well, know. Well, we mustn't have too much of a conversation. In a state of chaos. I know, we must, sorry, mustn't. I mean, Dominate who would have thought that the Labour Party would set up this crap PFI stuff when they did? But they did it. And, you know, we have to keep campaigning. Um. <laughs> I mean, much as we'd love to talk about NHS, maybe we should, if there are other bits of the, the terrain. All right, a quick, uh, all right, a quick one, a quick one. I do have inside knowledge. I am involved in the discussions that the ladies talk Holly is absolutely right. Basically what's happened is the private sector has failed where it's tried to take off their resources. There isn't any money to be made. There's no profit to be made. And therefore, there is virgin around the edges of healthcare, but fundamentally, it's failed. It's been tried in Huntingdon. So there are many issues to be discussed about the health service going forward, a lot to be fought and campaigned for. But I genuinely believe that the threat of wholesale privatisation is actually not the thing that we need to be focusing on. But we on. need to be very vigilant. Yeah. Right, somebody up there. Thank you. I uh, agree completely with, uh, with what you've said. Um, but it seems to me the ultimate answer to these issues is, is political, political change. Um, I joined the Labour Party uh, soon after Jeremy Corbyn was elected because I thought, well, here at last is someone who's challenging the market-driven consensus that the two parties, at, uh, at uh, Labour and Conservatives, had, uh, had locked themselves into. Um, but I suppose I'm under no illusions as to maybe the extent of his appeal beyond people like me, to be perfectly honest. And I'm just wondering, like, where do where do progressives go? <laughs> I've given up, I've given up uh, prognosis. I've put away the crystal ball. I no longer know uh, 
what's going to happen next. And when you think about the next election, think about the last election, Jeremy Corbyn did amazingly much better than most people, including me, thought he would. What do we think about the next election? We have no idea when it might be. You know, will it be caused by some particular final Brexit crunch? Or will they hang on, I think, probably, even if they get rid of May, until 2022? That is a long way away. How well Labour might do depends entirely. How catastrophic has the Brexit process been? What does the future look like? Who have they selected as leader? Is it going to be Boris or a Rhys Mogg, or is it going to be somebody who's sort of reasonably electable? All of these things are so unknown. When you look at elections, <coughs> it's about, you know, the balance of two sides, and we have no idea what the other side's going to be like. I don't know how well uh, Corbyn will do. One thing I'm absolutely... But, but, but I mean, you can get preoccupied by parliamentary arithmetic, because, I mean, a key thing is the willingness, not, I mean, that many of you in this room might be in agreement with us and might be willing to pay more taxes. Large, let's face it, large numbers of our fellow citizens aren't. They need to be persuaded, whether they're older, whether they're younger, that at the marginal pound in their pay packet would have to be divided in a different way and a larger proportion of it. Because you know, people like Jeremy Corbyn say, you can do it by taxing the 5% more heavily. You can't. The arithmetic doesn't support that. The median income tax payer, if we're going to do, go to income tax, would have to be prepared to pay a little more. And that requires a considerable act of persuasion. So even if Labour were to win an election, they would then have to persuade people that it is legitimate, and that that's the kind of word that would be used in 2020, to increase tax, whether national insurance contributions or income tax, to pay for extra public services. And that, in some parts of the country, maybe not in South Yorkshire, is going to be a big ask, and a lot of effort, political effort, is going to have to go into basic persuasion of people that they are having, going to have to pay more tax. And I think, it, you know, the facts on the ground will help that argument enormously, because by the time we get to the next election, I shudder to think what state these sorts of services are going to be in by then. And I think that's a, a strong persuader. Uh, and people, you know, you can see, the British Social Attitude Survey, it's been going since the early 80s, asks the same questions every year. It's the best series of, 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 of opinion. And it pretty much shows the pendulum swinging, that when a Conservative government has been in power for a long time, and the state services have become very thin, uh, and, and welfare has become you know, considerably meaner, public opinion swings towards greater generosity, greater willingness to pay taxes, uh, and greater emphasis on public services. After Labour had been in for 13 years, they sort of decided that, uh, oh, well, maybe we're paying too much tax, and maybe uh, too much is being spent on public services, and maybe we're being too generous through tax credits, and so on, and too poor. So that I think we're now seeing that that. But his, history is history is no guide to the future. No, I mean, look at what's happening in the United no. States. Look at what's happening in Italy. Look at what's happening in, in other European countries. You know, the terrible dark past of the 20th century can come back to haunt us. So we mustn't assume that there's some natural cycle of progressive uh, return. Yes, and then the woman up there in the middle. Yeah. So I just wanted to talk about the, uh, or ask you about the use of language. Right? So the, the memorable phrases we come up with are fixing the roof while the sun shines, maxing out their credit cards. We can still happily talk about some of Margaret Thatcher's favourite. You think about Tony Blair, you know, education, education, education. Those were things that were persuasive and talking about marginal propensities of spending pounds in the public sector versus the private sector just does not turn people on. And I think that uh, phrase, Jeremy Corbyn, for the many, not for the few, I think was incredibly persuasive. And I mean, I'm 100% behind everything you've said tonight. So um, the majority, the many, are the winners in, in, in a change of direction, and the few are the losers. So I think the Daily Mail doesn't desperately worry if it's got it, the nuances quite right when it comes out with its outrageous headlines. And, and, and to say that we can solve this by taxing the, five per, the, the top 5% may not be absolutely true. And I'm not trying to kid the electorate, but I think you have to recognize you need campaigning uh, narratives <coughs> that resonate with people, that motivate people. 
And that was, that, so that was Corbyn's success, that he, that he motivated people. And you know, we haven't got good narratives around um, how much of my satisfaction in life comes from public goods as opposed to private goods, for example. What is my snappy phrase for that? I, I haven't got it. Um, we talk about tax rates, but there are a whole load of tax rates, whether we're talking about VAT, we're talking about income tax, we're talking about corporation tax, we're talking about capital gains tax, and how those have changed and how the rich have, have benefited from selective changes in taxes versus how the population as a whole is. That, you know, and, and, and we've got to, the, the left or the progressives um, have got to have more compelling narratives that resonate with people that, you know, I'm not talking about inciting class warfare, but I want to be a bit closer you're to right, it. You're right. And that's in a sense what we wrote the book for, to give people ammunition, people who are out there campaigning, to say, you know, look at what's going on. Once people hear these stories, once they know what's happening, they are very shocked and say, well, we can't, this is not a civilized society anymore. Where, where does it go next? Is the very fabric of civilization beginning to, to give way? Uh, we must stop it. And the sorts of things that we're saying about um, reminding people what they really value, that resonates at once on the doorstep. And I just start doing a lot of canvassing, partly because I like to listen as well as talk. Um, and if you say things like that to people about what's happening locally, um, and what do they really mind about, what do they really worry about, you can have those conversations that can be very fruitful. But you're right, the snappy, um, entirely mendacious slogans have always been on the right, as they were in the Brexit campaign. They're just damn good at it because they don't care about the truth. And the trouble is the left is a bit screwed to that. But there's a problem, isn't there? I mean, we, we are in an age when people's uh, faith in, belief in the political class, left and right, is at a very, very low point. And the problem we have is that we have millions of people who work in public services who could and should be the voice of persuasion, whose daily interaction with patients, clients, uh, people in the classroom should, could be a mechanism to persuade people that the public services deserve their support. I went out last week with some district nurses in Milton Keynes, and I'm not suggesting that they should have a money conversation with their patients and say, look, I can only come and visit you because I'm being paid and I you know, need to, um, this health service needs extra money. But th there has, I think, to be some mechanism by which those who provide public services in people's homes, in hospitals, in clinics, do engage more with the public about the cost of the service and the need to support the service, not just financially, but in terms of uh, politics and organization. And we have this culture, which is in many ways admirable in Britain, which says, oh, the public service is neutral. The public servants should never talk politics. But I wonder if they did maybe talk small p politics more often, it might go some way to addressing this, this deficit that the left, the progressive left, left has in terms of the, the phrases of the right. Yes, uh, there was somebody, it, it was you, wasn't it? In the middle there. And then we'll come down to the man in the blue, in the green shirt next. Um, I just want to say quickly that my parents live in rural Wales and um, Three weeks ago, hold your microphone like that. Three weeks ago, they were told that their Meals on Wheels was finishing. There was no consultation, there was no discussion. They were just told it had been three weeks, and I, th I don't know why. You know, we, they then said, "Oh, we do have the money, but we're not going to do it anymore." These just sort of snapshots. But what I wanted to ask was um, universal credit, which is the one that we're expecting to come in now. I was thinking, I'm chair of governors at the largest primary school in Sheffield, which is on the east side, and 60% of our pupils, out of about 750 pupils, are on, <coughs> uh, called, are on pupil premium, which means that their parents are on benefits, which means that when uh, universal credit comes in, there's going to be real chaos, not just, if you like, for, for the people who are in receipt of it and when it arrives and everything, but the knock-on in things of paying for school meals, paying for school uniform and all the rest of it, that all of our public services are going to be really hammered, like housing benefit, pay, you know, there's going to be arrears, 
And I just wondered whether you had done any work or done any of your observations in places where there is already universal credit and is there light at the end of that tunnel or not? Judging by the report that came out yesterday, no. But it, it's not something that affects everybody, so it's, it's not something people seem to be worrying about. You may need to make a, a, a big noise about it locally as much as you can so people understand what's happening. The National Audit Office produced its, uh, the, one of the most devastating reports, and they, you know, they're pretty critical about a lot of what's going on, a lot of public services. Uh, absolutely shocking report on the state of universal credit, uh, how right from the beginning everything was got wrong, and then it was cut, and then cut again. And it's been, uh, you know, Ian Duncan Smith paid no attention at all to any of the problems along the way, ploughed on, and it is a disaster. And I think part of it is a disaster just because of the cuts that uh, Osborne kept taking more and more out of it. So when families on the whole moving from uh, tax credit onto universal credit as it rolls out, so far it's only in 10% of the country, are losing about a thousand pounds, just like that, the very poorest uh, families. Um, but the disarray of the way it's being organized as well, so they wait for five weeks, nothing, they get rent arrears, that they never catch up on. Uh, housing associations and councils uh, are desperate, and private uh, landlords are saying they won't take people on universal credit anymore. This is one of the most shocking cases of maladministration, as well as malice, uh, that you could see anywhere. And the more that everybody talks about it, and uh, you know, the government won't respond, I don't think, to this NAO report, it will just sit there. They are the official auditors is the controller and auditor general, and you'd expect them to have to respond, but they won't, but they'll respond in total ways, say you were putting right one of the anomalies or something. But it is a mighty, mighty calamity uh, that has cost a fortune. It's cost two million, two billion, uh, just in failing to administer it correctly. Uh, and it's been willful, uh, the extent to which for eight years this has plowed on and still got nowhere, and they haven't stopped it and just won't stop it. So I can only feel, um, you know, as chair of your of your school or governor of your school, I don't know how you're going to cope when schools are seeing their budgets cut so savagely. It is a dreadful thing. Uh, and the question is, how do we share the conscience of the nation to care when the assault on the idea of benefits, and anyone on a benefit is a scrounger, is a skyver. Uh, the fact that most people on, uh, most families who are poor are in work is beginning to get through. You're beginning to hear people repeat that back a bit more, finally, it's been true for a long time, finally that's beginning to get through. And I think people are softening their attitudes towards benefits, well, partly because they come across people, they see within their own families Right. Um, I think there's too much talk about money. I think it's a bit of a dead cat. My experience of the NHS and the local government is what's killing people is the management system they have to work under. The targets, the bad budgeting, the insecurity about when resources are going to arrive or not. Uh, and the point you made earlier on where um, there's not enough resources to address the problem in a way which actually prevents it, and you, you, you very expensively have to correct it and, and so on. And um, I've, I've worked in South Africa, I've worked in the Middle East, and I've worked in Eastern Europe and researched this area of public sector. And I can honestly see that um, when you look at the, in, in South Africa right now, they are rioting about the public services. They're killing people because they're so bad. In the, the Arab Spring, all the young people I spoke to when I was working in um, uh, Beirut, they said to me it was because of the public services. It wasn't about the vote. It was about we couldn't get the energy, we couldn't, the roads didn't work, the buses didn't work, and that was the catalyst for the, the explosion. 
Uh, and I think we're heading that way. I think what's going to happen to us is that we are going to gradually, we, we, it's a bit like the boiling frog. We, we, we adapt to the services of the lack, and then we keep adapting and adapting and get worse and worse, and suddenly we're penurious. Uh, and my question to you is, if, if you go on talking about the money, the budget, instead of this neoliberal management system that's killing people with its targets and things like that, you're not going to change anything. The institution will stay alive and just use up more of the money you give them. Well, yeah, right yeah I mean, we do, we do discuss in the book um, what's being called the new public management. That in fact, was a, a, an ideology about how organizations should work using very crude private sector analogies, that, as you know, brought in, uh, sold globally from the United States from the early 1980s onwards, and certainly imported into large chunks of the public sector uh, here in the United Kingdom. Um, never really tested, never really evidenced, but based upon the belief that you can make public, people in public organizations behave by giving them commercial uh, incentives. Part of that, obviously, was outsourcing, bringing in private companies. Part of it was a targets uh, culture, as, as if there was no such thing as an ethos, a culture of public service that differentiated it from what happened in, in markets and businesses. And of course, there is. And anyone who works in a public organization knows there is. Not often as, uh, 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 as good as it could be, but it, it's there. Um, I mean, the optimistic response would be that new public management has clearly failed. We, we can see examples of that. But you, you, you make a very good point. I mean, Polly's description of what's happened in the Department of Work and Pensions, and I apologize if some of you, you know, I know there's a big DWP office here in, in Sheffield. DWP is part of the problem in universal credit. It, it's money, but it's also a large-scale managerial failure. And, um, I, I hope you're not right, and that the state failure that's evident in the Middle East or in other countries uh, isn't going to happen here in, in, in that dramatic way. But you're right, we are seeing, I'm afraid, some evidence of it. I think we've just got time for maybe a couple more questions. Couple so we'll more. just ask okay. for um, maybe right. fairly short questions and fairly so brief responses. With Thank a you. microphone there, and there's a woman with a hand up there. We'll take these two. The gentleman at the, the front was talking about narratives. And I think one of the most powerful narratives we've heard uh, over the last period is about taking back control. And whilst in Brexit and what have you, it's been used in a very negative way, I do think that sense that people don't feel they have any control uh, is really important and underpins a lot of what you've been saying. Because whether it's about a parliament being elected that doesn't actually represent the will of the people because of the, the way the voting system doesn't... Uh, 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 makes it into a two-party state rather than a multi-party state, whether it's the huge centralization of powers uh, within central government, with the undermining of local authorities consistently so that people don't feel they have control. Uh, and so all the things you've been talking about where people in terms of campaigning, you know, it, it's like it has to be kind of pushed towards the, what the government's doing rather than what we can be doing locally because there isn't the control locally. So I think that whole thing about, it's not about left versus right necessarily, because I'm not convinced that the left uh, is, is taking on board in a serious fashion the need to really restructure our democracy and to make it really work. And that's why I find um, uh, uh, some of the arguments uh, that it goes beyond left and right. It, I don't want it to go government, Labour government, Tory government, Labour government. I want to see proper control given back to us, the people. It was the most brilliant slogan, take back control. Which of us doesn't feel that our life in a million ways is out of control and we're constantly trying to get control of this bit or that bit of it? So it had huge, deep resonance. But I think now you're beginning to see that it's been turned against them. It's been taken back saying, what does take back control really mean? And it's been used by the left and by people on, on, on all of these sorts of causes. You want control? What does that mean? It certainly doesn't mean a smaller state. It certainly doesn't mean less of everything. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right, although it's somewhat off theme from where we are now, that taking back control of democracy would mean proportional representation and being able to break up the system, being able to have parties that were closer to what people actually believed in, uh, as you have you know, in most European countries, 
who then come together in coalition, rather than these two great blocks where you have to hold your nose and vote for one or the other. Uh, and most people... Yeah, but it also requires people to be more willing to learn a little bit more about what happens in the civic space, and I'm afraid in local elections to come out and vote. I'm not sure what the last voting figure here in the city of Sheffield was, but I'll bet it wasn't much above 40%. Now, and, it's no, and it won't do say, oh, it's because we've got no powers. People can and must take more interest in local civic affairs. I bet you everybody here does. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yes. Did you want to do something else? Um, my question really um, draws on the last point that you made about people um, getting out and vote and getting engaged in civic affairs. And you're right, probably everyone in this room does, but equally, without assuming, there probably aren't that many people in this room who are on universal credit, who work in social care, who are using a food bank, and who are really feeling the hurt of austerity. And I door knock and canvas, and the people who are most affected by austerity, the austerity are the least likely to be on the electoral register and are least likely to be hearing these messages and understanding the need. And th there's just such a gap between the intellectual debate and the actual that's happening. You're absolutely right, it, but it's a perennial problem and it's always been so. I think it's got so much worse since there are so many fewer people who belong to trade unions. There is simply not the political education and that there used to be that people belong to all kinds of organizations, even churches and other things. People are far more atomized out there on their own. And the reason that you could cut welfare and cut and cut and cut to the bone is that this is families on their own suffering behind their front door. Uh, they're not part of any collectivity with other families in the same situation. There is no, they feel there's nowhere that they can be, their voice can be heard collectively. And um, I think that is a very real problem about the way we live now, and political parties um, getting out there is often the best hope of engaging people, but it's, you know, you know, I mean, I do it a lot too, it's, it's up to work trying to get people involved in your local Labour Party or whatever party. It's, it's difficult, and people don't see the connection between their lives and something as abstract as politics. So I'm not interested in politics. Well, you know, what about this and what about that and what about this? And don't you worry about this? Oh, yes, I'm very worried about all those things, and then they'll be full of things. But it's not politics, and it's making that connection between the real world and politics that's often very difficult. I'm sorry we've got time for more, but I'm afraid it's over. <laughs> but thank you very much indeed. And I just want to say to you, we are signing our books outside, and it always worries us very much what you're saying that the only people who ever read our books already agree with everything you say. So if you do uh, uh, buy a book, will you please lend it to somebody who won't agree, if you know anyone, whether it's a neighbor, an annoying relative, a colleague, you know people, maybe not in Sheffield, but in most places, <laughs> you know somebody who might be of a different, a different persuasion about these things, please lend it to them. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Polly and David. So, Polly and David will be holding a signing outside Rhyme and Reason. Uh, the bookshop have got books for sale as well from uh, some of our other uh, keynote speakers um, from during the festival. Um, just before uh, you leave entirely, just a very brief plug. Uh, the Festival of the Bay is closing uh, next Friday, and our closing party is uh, an event to mark 100 years of women's suffrage. And we have Helen Pankhurst uh, who will be doing a talk based on her book, Deeds Not Words, and a poet called Holly McNeish, Selena Godden, and a local band called Before Breakfast and Girl Gang DJs. And that's all at the beautiful Ambidale Pitcher House uh, on Friday the 29th of June. Thank you very, very much for coming. Cheers. <laughs>